Bible. Luke chapter 16, verse 10 through 13 says, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? True riches is saying that worldly wealth is not true riches. That's interesting. It says, who, how can you have real, real riches if you can't be trusted with just the worldly wealth? It says, if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We've been in this series, and once you start talking about money in church, it gets real hot in the room, and uh, you know it gets a little tense, and you can cut the tension, you know, with with the knife. But I'm just committed as a pastor, and we're committed as a church to preach the Bible unapologetically and to present it to you. So your job is is, is to listen, to receive, and then to decide for you and your family how you will apply what is taught from the Word of God. It's not my job to censor what we give to you. It's my job to present to you the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And you get to, as a believer, as a mature man or woman of God, dissect and look at that word and see how it applies to your life. So we don't make any apologies for talking about money. We talk about money. The church is ran by the generosity of the people that are a part of the church. That's how the church has always been run. That's how it began in the book of Acts. That we make no excuses or or um, don't try to talk about it any other way. That's the way it is. But at the same time, we say this, that if you do not believe in some of the concepts that the Word of God puts out, this is our challenge to you. Don't give to us. Give to someone else. If you're worried about the motives of the house, then give to a different house and let God bless you. Step into blessing. Step into obedience and let him prove the concept to you. Most of my pastor buddies do not agree with that last statement. Like, don't, don't tell people that. They'll do it. That's fine. You can do it because I found something out is that this job is not my provider. My streams of income are not my provider. God's my provider. I know this for you is that your job is not your provider. That that God is your provider. I know this about the church. That God is our provider. It is, although we are, we are ran, although I operate my life based on the income I receive, and though we run the church based on the generosity of the people in it, it is not our provider. Every time that we get into that position, we begin to lean on or rely on the wrong thing. And so I'm going to dissect some things with us as we talk about this money. And uh, I just want you to know that God takes us all at wherever we are in our journey. So you don't have to feel any shame or condemnation, anything that I'm saying. I'm just trying to give you what the Word of God says. So I hope that doesn't put pressure on you in a wrong way. I hope that it does pressure you to begin to obey uh, what the Word of God says. But I'll say this is everyone is walking in their own journey. And so you got to take this. you got to apply it to your life the best way that you can. Today is my son Jude's uh, third birthday. And um, he's... He's, he's crazy, and I never, not, never knew how much joy he b- would bring uh, our life. And so uh, I love Jude, and so uh, I knew that uh, when we were in Washington a couple months ago, we were there, and I knew that we needed to toughen him up a little bit because we went on a hike. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, and I've told some of you this story before, and we were walking through the woods, and he said, Daddy, that is a big tree. I said, yeah, it is, son. He said, let's buy one. So I said, all right, um, we're going camping, and we're going on a mission trip. This, that, that's it. He has been at North Park more than he's been in the forest. This is an issue. Like, we've got, we got to get out into the woods. This is, this, this is not good. He just thinks, oh, yeah, let's just, let's just buy one, Dad. Let's just buy one. Let, let, let's just, if, if I see it, I must be able to buy it. I, I want you to know something about money is money works as a substitute to God. It's not money's fault, but it's how we use money and how we view money. It works as a substitute for God. Money promises things that only God can give. If I got this amount, then I would. If I started making this month, then we wouldn't be so tight. If I could do this or do that, it forms itself or positions itself as a substitute for the things that only God can do. Money says that you don't need God. 
If you do not know how to view money properly or use money properly, money begins to communicate that you do not need God. You, you, ever, you ever just been like, like, like making nothing? I mean, like at the end of your rope, like nothing, nothing. And you needed God. I mean, you needed God to keep the lights on in the house. Boy, the, I mean, you're talking, but the bills come in. It's like, God, how is this going to happen? We need you. We, we love you. But when everything turns around, you start making more money. You become a little more self-sufficient. And you don't worry about those things as much because you have enough to cover whatever comes. So your dependency shifts a little bit because now you've made it enough to rely on what you have. But this is the way and this is the position that money has to continue to stay on is that money has to continue to stay in a position of service to you, not dependence. We cannot depend on the money. we got to make the money serve what God's doing. I like to say it this way. Wealth must be devoted to serving God, not replacing Him. Wealth must be devoted to serving God, not replacing Him. The biblical definition of wealth is having enough to meet your needs and some left over. Which means that almost every one of us in this room are wealthy. Did you know in the view of the world, not, the, not America, in the view of the world, you are very wealthy. You're, you're, you're wealthy. And the Bible, according to Bible stipulations, and it, it, it really, we are wealthy. We have enough to meet our needs, and then many of us have some leftover, and that is wealth. And that wealth must be devoted to serving God, not to replacing Him. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to have nice things or enjoy your money, enjoy your wealth, enjoy your finances. You just have to make sure that the money is serving the purpose of God, which means, and we say this a lot, it is not, God is not opposed to you having money. He's opposed to money having you. That position is key as we step in to understanding what we're going to talk about today. The subject of the Bible is God. If you break down the Bible in a grammatical sentence, the subject of the Bible is God. But the verb of the Bible is generosity. Some people would argue that the, the verb of the Bible is love. But it's really not love. If you actually look at it, and we looked at this scripture last week, for God so loved the world that he, the action is actually that he gave. The emotion that drove the action was love, but the actual verb of the Bible is give. It is generosity. So everything that God does, he's a giver. Now listen to this. This, this is interesting, but you are most like God when you give. When you're giving, you are most like God. God, you are in unison, you're connected, that is like him, that is his character to give, the love that causes to give. Now I want to talk about the tithe for a couple moments uh, here, and I want to break down some elements of it, and, and there's all kinds of different beliefs and arguments about this, and uh, I, I think that Robert Morris, Pastor Robert Morris from Gateway probably has some of the best teaching I've ever heard on the giving, on generosity, on the tithe. It's a local church here, a phenomenal pastor, man of God. You could look up some of his uh, writings, some of his uh, messages on this. He's absolutely the best. But I want to give you some of this study uh, that I, as I've looked at the tithe, I think it's going to help you understand what it is and why we do it. Exodus chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. This is... Before the law, okay, this predates the law. It says, the Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me every firstborn male, the first. This is what you have to understand about the tithe. The tithe is the first. It's the first. All throughout the Bible, all throughout the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, it is the first. First, the Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me every firstborn male, the first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. Their resources, their currency in that day, their children and what they possess, it says the first of all these must be given to me. Now if you scoot down the chapter to verse 12, it says this, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. And this is an interesting verbiage because it says belong. It doesn't say should be given. It says that it's already his. It says redeem this with a lamb, every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck, redeem every firstborn among your sons. And I wish we had time to go into that because it was only redeemed by a lamb. And if you know the Bible like, like anybody else in this room possibly, that the Lamb of God was given to redeem the world. Did you know that Jesus was actually God's tithe? 
He was the lamb that was slain for the redemption of mankind. When the first was given, the rest was redeemed. I don't know if you know this or not, but we were under a curse of sin. We were under a curse of darkness. But when Jesus gave his life, or God gave his son, that curse was broken. When the first was given, the rest was redeemed. And we see this all throughout scripture. Tithing predates the law, it's in the law, and continues all the way through the New Testament. Tithing, let me give you a couple things. Tithing breaks the curse of the world. It breaks the curse of the world. What is a tithe? The Bible says that a tithe is a tenth, and it also can be translated a test. A tenth and a test. So in Bible times in the Old Testament, it was customary that whenever you had an increase of any kind, a bonus, a birth, a give, any type of salary, 10% of it would be given to the house of God. It was customary. This happened. What that does is when we, when we tithe, it breaks the curse of materialism in your life. I don't know if you've ever felt like this, but it, it, it happens very easily is that we get under this idea of cultural um, keeping up with the Joneses. And it begins to pull on you and draw on you. And, and you feel like, I'm, I have to have this, or I must be at this level, or I have to make this, or I have to possess this. Tithing begins to break the curse. It says, I'm not going to hoard to myself. I am going to give from the first of what I have. Tithing breaks my dependence on money. It breaks my dependence on money. When I tithe, when I give a tenth, when I give 10% of whatever I receive and I give it to the Lord, it, it says and it helps me break my dependence on that money. If you're living paycheck to paycheck, you understand this is there is a certain dependence on every penny that you have. And to give some of that is to break dependence on yourself and to put dependence on God. Tithing breaks the selfishness in us. It breaks the selfishness in us. God is generous. He is a giver. That's who he is, his character, his nature. He doesn't contain generosity. He is generosity. He doesn't try to be generous. He is generous. That is his nature. That is who he is. I'll tell you something about God is God can't operate outside of his nature. He can't. This is, there's some things that God can't do. And God cannot operate outside of what he is, which means that God can't lie because he is truth. He can't operate outside of that because that's who he is. He, it breaks the selfishness in me. Now I want to look quickly at the tithe, and I'll give you a couple things on this. The tithe is a test of our obedience. The tithe is a test of our obedience. Now, nobody likes to think about this, and nobody really enjoys uh, talking, usually in a, in, a, in a service like this, about the tithe. But I'm going to tell you this. This concept could set you free. Last week after we preached part one, I had person after person after person come to me and say, Pastor, we've never implemented these processes or this obedience until we heard you preach on it or heard you teach on it or Pastor Steve teach on it. And we begin to do it, and they begin to tell me the journey of their life. Honestly, I, they have more faith in it than I do. I'm listening to them. said, all we did was do what she said to do, and God began to bless us. My, my kids started serving God. I mean, crazy stuff. My income doubled. All of a sudden, that materialism that was on me was broken off of me. I mean, crazy testimonies that have, we've heard about just this last week. Now, let me give you, this is the passage of Scripture that everybody goes to about the tithe. Okay, I want to give it to you because you need to know this, and, and, and then we'll explain it a little bit. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Or if you're newly saved, you might say Malachi. I had one of my buddies that just gave his heart to the Lord, and he was doing like a little testimony. He's like... If, if everybody could just turn to Malachi, uh, it's like Malachi, Kalachi, or but it's anyways, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. It says this now, you have to see the first part of this. It says, Go ahead, put it up. It says, I, the Lord, do not change. Now, you have to keep that in your mind as we unpack the rest of this because. It says that the Lord does not change in the context of what is about to be stated. It was important for the writer to say that the Lord doesn't change before he put something that would then be controversial to the church now and to most people that teach it say that it expired in the Old Testament, but the Lord 
doesn't change. It doesn't change when the Old Testament changed. Now, there are some things that are under grace now that were under law, but this concept we read in Exodus predates the law, which means before the law was given, this ordinance was given. It says, I, the Lord, do not change, so you... The descendants of Jacob are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? It says, yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? And this is what God says. In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse. Your whole na- Now, I'm not telling you that. This is what, I'm just reading the Bible, okay? Don't get mad at me. It says you're under a curse, your whole nation, because the reason is because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe, not 9%, not 8%, not 7%, not 7.5%. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. So not just given to a, to a nonprofit, not just given, bring it into the house, into the storehouse. And that, that there may be food in my house. This is how God set up how the church would move forward, the kingdom of God would advance, how the, the lost would be found, how the poor would be uh, ministered to, how the hungry would be fed through this. This, this. this is the concept that is laid out, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. You will not find this anywhere else in the scriptures where God asks or gives us permission to test him in something. He says, test me in this. So I say if some of you that are right on the edge saying, man, I've never tithed, but I've been thinking about it, I would, I would challenge you, test him in it. Do a three-month trial run. Just test him in it and see what he said to test him. So go ahead and put the word into practice. Says the Lord Almighty, and see, test me and see if. I will not, this is not the reason we do, but when we do, there is a reward that comes. It says not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. This passage actually says that when we do not tithe, we rob God. Now, again, I'm not trying to put condemnation on you. I'm trying to illuminate what the scriptures say. And you've got to take it in your own speed, at your own pace, where you are in your life. But this is what the scripture says. This is how we rob God. He says the whole tithe, 10%, needs to be brought into the house. And we say if you're you're leery about the integrity of the house or leery about giving your money, give it to someone else. Give it to another house. Not to it, not to wherever you want, not to just a, a, a nonprofit, not you gotta give it to a house, a, a church. You gotta bring it into the storehouse and give it. Test God in this and see if he doesn't bless you. That's what the passage says. So the tithe is a test of our obedience. This, this is what is interesting. Sometimes we take ownership over our money to a point of we really actually think it's ours. Everything we have is ours. We own it. We, it belongs to us. So now we've got to decide if we can give it. Let's just say before this service, I went over to Keon. I gave him $100. And I said, hey, can you hold this for me? I'm going to come ask for it later. But just can you hold it for me for a second? I gave it to him. And then now I said, hey, can I have that $100 back? He would not have a problem giving me that $100 back. Here's the reason. It was mine. It was mine. It's easy. Now, if I just went up to him right now and said, hey, can I have $100? It would be difficult. He'd probably do it. But it would be difficult because it was his. See, this is where our perspective gets in the way of our obedience. Because our perspective is, this is my hard-earned money. Boy, I worked overtime. I made this happen. When you do that, you begin to step out of the power and the provision of God and say, I can do it on my own. I can do this on my own. And some of you have done very well for yourself on your own, but think what you could do with God's blessing. So the argument is, well, I'm doing all right, doing what I can, giving when I can. Think what you could do. If you begin to step into obedience and begin to step into generosity and let God bless you and bless your household and bless your finances and bless your family and bless your relationships, because our perspective of money is that giving is all about money. But giving does not stop with money or start with money. 
It includes money, but it involves your heart. It involves your relationships. It involves your worship. It is so much bigger than money. We don't give our tithe. We bring it because you cannot give what is not yours. Does this make sense? So when, when God's asking for a tithe, he's not asking for something that is ours. He's asking for something that is his. Because we read in Exodus that the first of everything belongs to him. So when he asks of us 10%, he's asking for the 10% that he gave us, that he said, I'm going to ask for this back. So we should be able to joyously give him back what he gave us to hold. And that obedience, the Bible teaches us, unlocks the blessing of God. Now our understanding of money and what we've been talking about is do we do it for that blessing? No. That motive is a selfish motive and God is trying to destroy selfishness in us. It has to be obedience. The tithe is obedience. It is generosity. It is willingly to follow what God put in our hearts, what God put in his word for us to follow. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, I'll show you this in the New Testament. It says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Jesus don't play. You know what I'm saying? It's like, can you imagine if we had a guest speaker come up here and he just like, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church 1132. Woe to you, you bunch of hypocrites. The people that Jesus is speaking to are the religious leaders. It'd be even worse than this. It would be like, okay, all our small group leaders, all our lead teams, come on, come on, Tuesday night. Pastor Steve gets up, not me. Pastor Steve gets up. <laughs> says, you bunch of hypocrites. Like, that's how he lays it out. I mean, he just, he does not play. All these people that say Jesus was all about just making people feel good and, and warm and cuddly did not read this passage. I mean, woe to you is a little intense. It says, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Now listen what he's saying. He says, you give a tenth, a tithe, of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law. So what he's saying is, this tithe thing is a basic thing. It's a, the thing that we will split hairs about. Jesus is saying, this is a, this is a basic thing. Th this is not even the most important thing. This tithing thing is just, that's mine. Stop arguing about it. Just give it back. Like, he says, now let's deal with the most important things. He says, you've neglected these, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. He says, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Let me just ask you this question. If Jesus asked you to tithe, would you tithe? Right? Because we know how we'd answer that question. But what is he saying? This is in red. In your, if you got a red letter edition, this is in red. He says you should have practiced. What is practice? A once in a, once in a moon? What, an occasion? No, it is a routine. He says you should have practiced this while not neglecting that. Do you know what I found? Is some people are really good at this or really good at that. And we're really bad at this and that. We've, we've got to begin to practice justice and faithfulness and mercy while not neglecting what, what Jesus says. I'm not saying it. What Jesus says is the elementary thing. I know you work hard. I know, I know you put in long hours. I know you've devoted yourself to provide for your family. I, I'm, just telling you, I'm just telling you what Jesus said. Jesus said you've got to do both. You've got to put this into practice. So the tithe is a test of our obedience. The tithe is also a declaration of of our trust in God. Where your tithe goes is who you thank for your increase. When you tithe, it's a declaration saying, God, I'm going to trust you. It is a declaration saying, God, I trust you that you can do more with my 90% than I can do with my 100. That does not work in our natural math. 100% more than 90%. Okay. But it's not who has it or what, how, what the amount is. It is who's working with it. Did you know that if a golf club in my hands is like a spectator sport? I mean, it's like I've been trying to get lessons, trying to get better, but, it, but it's hilarious. But you put a golf club in, in, in Ricky Fowler's hands 
or one of these pro golfers hands and it becomes a source of income he's he's a professional it's the same club but it's in different hands ricky fowler can do more with the golf club than i can Dak Prescott can do, I'm trying to help you. I can throw a football. I can throw a football pretty well. I feel like I can play football pretty well. But the same football in my hands is different if it's in Dak Prescott's hands. He has a skill level that I don't have. So I shouldn't say, well, I have a football, you have a football. It's different. Listen. You saying I've got my money or God has my money is like such a ridiculous, just a ridiculous example to give God. He says, okay, God, what I can do with 100%, you could kill with 90%. So whenever I tithe, I'm saying this is a declaration of trust in God. God, I'm choosing you and I'm trusting you. What we do with the money in our hands is a sign of what we're doing with God and our hearts. we got to move on quickly. I'll read it again. What we do with the money in our hands is a sign of what we're doing with God in our hearts. The tithe is a declaration of our trust in God. Thirdly and lastly, the tithe is a reminder of what God has done. And this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time. And, and this, this is everything about generosity. The tithe is a reminder of what God has done. In that same passage of Scripture in Exodus, in the, in the verses that come after what we read, verses 14 through 16, it says this. In days to come, when you're, Exodus chapter 13, verse 14 through 16. In days to come, when your son asks you, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand. Now let, let me help you here. What is he saying? What does what mean? The fact that you give the firstborn of everything that comes. It's like, that would be, that's hard to understand. For a son to look at his dad and say, Dad, you're like kind of in the, you're in the cattle business. You're in the ranching business, but you keep on killing the firstborn. That doesn't make sense. So he says, when your son asks you why you give the first of what you have, say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn of both people and animals in Egypt. That is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons. And it will be like a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead. What? That the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. Now what does that mean for us? That means... In our day, it would be like your kid coming to you and saying, why are you giving money away? Why are you giving this away? He says, come here. Let me tell you. The reason that we do this is that your dad hasn't always been the person that he is right now. But because of Jesus, because of his mighty hand, because of his grace, because of his mercy, I was transformed from what I was to what I am. I'm a work in progress. I had a chance, a second chance at life, a second chance at growing. That is why we give the first of everything that we do to the Lord. This is fueled, generosity is fueled by gratitude. This is why we give a ten. Yes, it's a sign of obedience. Yes, it's a test of your trust and a declaration of your dependence on God. But this is, this, this to me is everything. It is a reminder Every single time I get paid, every single time there's an increase and I write a check or I deposit money online, it's a reminder of God, thank you that you brought me out of what I was in. Thank you that you didn't leave me like I was. Thank you that you had the grace, that you had the mercy, and that you had the power to bring me out of what I was bound up in. See, many of us, we don't understand the power that it took to save us. We forget about who we used to be and the journey that we used to be on. We forgot that the grace of Jesus saved us. And I'll tell you, friend, that when you remember what God did, it will change the way that you live. It will change the way that you give. It is not about the amount or the law or the religious duty. It is about Jesus changed my life and my result, my response to that is generosity. It is generosity. That's what we see here. He says, bring your kids in. Bring your son in and tell them, we used to be slaves. We used to, did you know you used to be a slave? 
it, before you said yes to Jesus, and maybe you, you're here and you haven't said yes to Jesus today, you used to be a slave, or you are a slave if you haven't said yes to Jesus. And all it takes, this is the crazy thing about God, is all it takes is a yes. And he switches you from slave to son. In a second, in a moment, the Bible says that whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come in a moment. That's what happened to me. That's what happened to hundreds of you here. It's that God saved you in a moment. And when we tithe, it's just different than just giving. It's different than a religious duty. It's different than a reluctant heart. It is absolutely. God, if you had the power to save me how I was, then surely you got the power to get me through a month on 90%. Every time we tithe, it is a reminder of how God set us free. So this is my challenge. T test God. The Bible says testament, testament. Well, do this. Every time you tithe, think about what God set you free from. Oh, man, it, it'll, change, it'll change the way that you give. It'll change. It was probably about two years ago I heard uh, Robert Morris teaching on some of this and read his book called The Blessed Life and, and so read some of these things. And I had always tithed. We've been tithers and God's blessed us. It's been amazing. But something shifted in my heart and I said, this concept of remembering was something that just shook me. And I began to tithe differently. I'm telling you, I began to tithe differently. Whenever I tithe, I would make sure that I was given thanks I, I was able to do what we talked about last week. I was able to give with a cheerful heart. And God began to bless us. I'm telling you, God's blessing us. His blessing is on. Why? So we do this to get a blessing? No, but there is a blessing that comes with obedience. The problem is, with most of our money, is that we become owners instead of stewards. That we think that we own what we should steward. Let me just give you this. Owners feel in control. Stewards feel responsible. Owners say, ask my permission. Stewards say, ask God's permission. Owners give direction. It's mine. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell it where it goes and when it goes there. Stewards apply direction. Owners feel proud of their ability to give. Stewards are humbled that they have the ability to give. You know, I've found this, is that when you fall in love, your have-tos change to want-tos. I found this, that when I became a steward, instead of an owner, I wanted to do what God asked me to do. When I realized I was just giving back, instead of I had to accumulate for myself, to protect myself, and to provide for my family. Wait, God, you're, you're in control? I know it's cliche, but it's biblical. That he is our provider. He is in control. Let me give you this last story and we'll be done. In, in, in John chapter 11, there is, there is a wild story. And this is going to apply to your finances, but it's really, and this is what Jesus always did, is he took whatever we're talking about to get to the heart. We talked about this last week. And so I, I want to talk about what we're talking about, but I also want to deal with what I believe God wants to deal with today. Because in John chapter 11, the Bible tells a story about a man by the name of Lazarus. Lazarus was sick and was a friend of Jesus. And when they sent word to Jesus that he was sick and they wanted him to come and pray for Lazarus, Jesus stayed where he was for a couple more days. Do you ever feel like when you really need Jesus, he like didn't show up? You know what I'm talking about? Like he's just like a couple days late. That's what happened. He's a couple days late. But this is what happened when he was late is Lazarus died. Dead. And Mary and Martha run to him and say, Jesus, if you would have been here. You ever felt like that? If you would have been here, Jesus, if you would have came through, if you would have showed up, if you would have been here a little earlier, this would, I wouldn't be in this debt. I wouldn't be in this mess. I wouldn't be, if you would have came a little earlier. And it says that Lazarus was dead, and you know the story. Lazarus was dead, and Jesus walks into town and has this conversation, and he raises Lazarus from the dead. Which is amazing. I'm just like, are you kidding me? Lazarus is dead. He's been in the tomb for four days. Jesus raised him from the dead. He comes out. He's mummified. He's got grave clothes on. They say, take the grave clothes off. Let him go. And we all celebrate. We love that story. I preach that Matt passage. It's awesome. But John chapter 12 happens right after John 11. And the story continues. 
And John chapter 12, they're all sitting around probably celebrating what happened with Lazarus. They're in the same city. They're with the same people. It says that they're cooking a great meal. They're, they're celebrating. And you know what's interesting? And if you were here for conference week with Sean Smith, he talked about Mary and Martha. But it says in John chapter 12 that Martha was serving the people. What she was doing back then, she was still doing. She never changed. She was always doing, doing, doing. And it says, but Mary came to Jesus in John chapter 12 with a jar of expensive perfume. And it says that she broke the jar at Jesus' feet and she anointed his feet with this perfume. It says that she washed his feet with this expensive perfume. She used her hair to, to wash his feet. The problem was that that perfume was some of the most expensive perfume in that day. Scholars would tell us that it was up to a year's wages. And once the seal was broken on the perfume, it was useless to the world. You could not resell it once the seal had been broken. So she took that perfume that was worth maybe a year's wages, maybe in our money, maybe forty to $50,000 in this day, a year's wages, and she breaks it at the feet of Jesus. She breaks the seal, and it becomes useless to the world. But hear this. It says the fragrance of the offering filled the house. So what she gave in her generosity filled the house that she lived in. Now watch this. Why did Mary give that expensive of a gift? There's only one explanation. Grateful. Grateful. She had it when she walked with Jesus before Lazarus was raised from the dead. Why didn't she break it then? Why, did, why didn't she give what she... If she wanted to give it all this time, she had plenty of opportunity. They were with Jesus all the time. Why didn't she give it to him? No, it was gratitude. When Jesus showed up and said, no, Lazarus will not die, get up and get on out of here. When she saw that he had the power over death, she said, oh my goodness, God, I can't keep what was once valuable to me. In light of what you just did, holds no more value. i got to give it to you. I've got to lay it at your feet. And when she laid it at his feet, the Bible says that the fragrance filled the house. I wonder if God is waiting to fill his house and to fill churches all over America. I wonder if it's waiting on the generosity of his people to say, God, thank you. I'm going to bring something that was once valuable to the world into your house. I'm going to break it at your feet. I'm going to give it to you because in light of what you've done, this is worthless now. I found this out about God. What is worthless to the world is very valuable to God. Before it was broken, it was valuable to the world. After it was broken, it was valuable to Him. I found this out about my personal life. Is that if I'm not broken, I'm valuable to the world. But when I'm broken, I'm valuable to Him. That, that's, that's it why is Jesus out for our money because of that that right there that we, would, that we would break before him that we would not run after our own gain and our own aim and our own popularity and our own security be our own providers but we say God our trust is in you our dependence is on you. We're yours. We're laying it down. The things that were once valuable, my dreams, my aspirations that are so valuable to my peers and my friend, it just that's worthless now because I'm going to break those dreams at your feet and say, whatever you want from me, God, I'll give it to you. Whatever you want from me is yours. I'm telling you what God's after is more than a tithe. He's after your heart. He's, he's after your relationships. He's after your occupation. He's after your, 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 your leisure time. He's after it all. He wants to be in it. He wants to be around it. He wants to be with you. I'm telling you, we preach this weak Christianity that says give God a token. Give God a peace. Give God five minutes. I'm telling you, God doesn't want just a peace. He wants it all. He doesn't work at second position. He doesn't work in third position. He only works as number one. And we got to make him number one. One. That's why we sing songs like worthy. You are worthy because no one else is worthy. We don't sing our job is worthy. Our job is worthy. But yet we give money to our job first. Or we give money to our leisure activities first. Or we give money to our mortgage first. We don't say, oh, worthy are you mortgage worthy. We just trust 
that need more than we trust God to provide for it. I'm telling you, we've got to change everything. We've got to change everything. Well, that's just old school. Maybe we need to go old school. Well, we're living under a new dispensation of grace and generosity. Maybe we need to go back to what the people that really studied the word said. Instead of sidewalk prophets and basement bloggers and people who think that they have an idea to try to escape the calling and the ordinance of God. Maybe we should just say that's what the Bible says, so I'm going to buckle the seatbelt and do it. I'm sorry, that was a little hard, y'all, right? Smile break, breathe. I I saved that for the 6 o'clock and it just came out at 930 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just want to, in the day we live in, we got to see the church rise up. We have to. And you know what? It's not something new. It's something really old. It's written in the word. It's hidden in sacrifice, dependence, and dedication. It's like we can try to dress it up and make Christianity, Christianity as leisure, leisurely activity as we can. Just try to make it as as acceptable to everybody as we can. I'm just going to tell you, it always has been about laying down our life. It, it, It always has been. Right? That's what Jesus said. It always has been about laying this life down so that we can find true life in him. Gratitude really is the fuel of generosity. Would you stand with me this morning?